Welcome to this lecture series on JFK and the Civil Rights Movement. This is part one, the election of 1960. The presidential election of 1960 fundamentally changed how elections were going to be run in the United States. Whereas in 1952, you had your first television advertisements, in 1960, we're actually going to have our first ever presidential debate televised for everyone to listen to. <clears throat> On the 26th of September, 1960, Richard Nixon and John Kennedy will debate on television, fielding questions from the major networks, right? Uh, Nixon really had failed to realize the importance of image in debates, right? He had actually been campaigning all morning in Chicago. He was pretty tired. Uh, he had recently uh, sustained a knee injury, which had become infected, and he was recovering from the flu, um, which had caused him to lose about 20 pounds. Um, and so he was already kind of in rough shape going in. Uh, he hit his knee on the door frame coming out of the car. And so when he comes in to uh, get ready for these debates, he is angry, he's tired, and they begin putting the makeup on him. JFK comes walking in and says, oh, look at you getting all prettied up. And he just gets furious and goes, that's it, get this off of me, right? And he pushes them all away, okay? Uh, meanwhile, JFK is asked by the uh, network, so do you want us to get your makeup done? And he says, no, no, we're fine. Uh, and then he goes into a back room where he actually had his own private makeup crew get him ready to go. Kennedy did understand how important image was. And so when this debate took place, um, the differences are very telling. Nixon is got all those lights on him, but he's got no makeup clogging his pores up. So he's sweating uh, he's, I mean, he just, he, he's pale. He, he looks horrible. Matter of fact, uh, Chicago mayor Richard Daly said, oh my God, they've embalmed him before he even died. Uh, one re reporter described him as looking like a drowned weasel. Meanwhile, Kennedy looks, you know, calm and, and, you know, fresh and young and tan and tan. He's not tan. He's from Massachusetts. Uh, he does have Addison's disease though, that causes kind of that discoloration of the skin. Um, but ultimately, when you look at this debate, Kennedy, for everybody that watched this debate, Kennedy won. Now, those who were polled who had only heard it on the radio said Nixon had better answers. He had actually won the debate if you only heard it. But most people, the vast majority of people who saw it said he def that Kennedy definitely won. And so we see this movement into image, right? Visual image thanks to television, is now become a very dominant part of electioneering. Now, despite all this, this was still a really close presidential election. Nixon isn't the Nixon that we know today, right? This is well before Watergate. Nixon is the esteemed vice president of the United States, the one that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Khrushchev in Moscow in what became known as the kitchen debate, right? Uh, this election is one of the closest ones in American history, right? Um, a matter of fact, JFK is going to win by just a little bit over 100,000 votes in the popular vote, and the Electoral College is going to be relatively close as well. There's going to be a lot of accusations of voter fraud, ballot uh, stuffing, uh, things like that, so much so, in fact, that Nixon's own handlers suggest you need to challenge this election. He took, and they name off a few key states, you know, that you probably actually won, right? This is a stolen election. And so they urged Nixon to challenge this election in the courts, but Nixon is going to refuse. He's gonna say, I can think of no worse example for nations abroad who for the first time are trying to put free electoral procedures into effect than that of the United States wrangling over the results of our presidential election and even suggesting that the presidency itself could be stolen by thievery at the ballot box. And so Nixon graciously steps down, or at least doesn't challenge, and JFK becomes president of the United States. So on January 20th, 1961, John F. Kennedy is sworn in as the youngest president in U.S. history. He's also one of the more sickly presidents we've ever had. As I mentioned before, he suffers from Addison's disease. He also had chronic back problems that often kept him strapped down to a gurney and given a cocktail of different uh, drugs to ease the pain. Uh, he was the first Catholic to ever be elected to the president. He's an Irish Catholic. Usually that was very difficult to do because the fear was is that if you're Catholic, you're gonna take orders from the Pope. 
He's even going to have to campaign and say, hey, look, I am not going to take orders from the Pope. Uh, he won a Pulitzer Prize for a book called Profiles in Courage, which he probably actually didn't even write. It was probably actually ghostwritten by Ted Sorensen. And then, of course, he gives his inaugural speech. This one has one of the most famous lines in uh, inaugural speech history. Uh, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. A phrase that is often taken out of context uh, most of the time it is brought up. This is always seen as a very patriotic speech and a very patriotic statement by JFK, but it's actually just a component of a Cold War speech. JFK is letting Nikita Khrushchev know that I, too, am a Cold Warrior president, and I, too, don't let my youth fool you. I, too, am going to fight and win the Cold War. And we can see this just by looking at the speech. So let's take a closer look at this inaugural speech. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and success of liberty. See, this is literally throwing the gauntlet down to the Soviets and to Khrushchev. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have ever been granted the role of defending freedom in its hours of maximum danger. I do not shirk from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people and any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. Now we get to the famous line. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. But now to put it in its proper perspective, we need to go one line further. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. He is letting Khrushchev know that he just like the old general, even though he's young, he too is going to be a Cold Warrior president. He too intends on fighting and winning the Cold War. And unfortunately, his initial forays into this are going to be met with some, well, pretty disastrous results. <laughs> 